Amen. All right, John chapter number 16. I love the way that this chapter ends. There's a lot of great content in this chapter. He says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There's a lot of hope. There's a lot of things that, that Jesus says there. One, of, I mean, he says, hey, you're in the world. You're going to have tribulation. If you're going to live a sold out, separated life, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're going to be one of his disciples, if you're going to be someone who follows and lives your life in a way that's going to be pleasing unto the Father and pleasing unto our Lord Jesus Christ, then you will have tribulation in this world. But we don't need to let that tribulation get us down. We don't need to let that tribulation get us anxious or upset or, or discouraged. He says, be of good cheer. Amen. Don't worry about it. Actually, be happy. Why? Because I've overcome the world. That's right. Amen. Jesus Christ has overcome the world. So any of these battles, anything that we have to face, anything that's difficult, at the end of the day, we really don't have to worry about it. You don't have to let it bother you that much. Now, it's going to be a part of your life. And he's warning us and he's telling us, hey, this is going to happen to help us in order for us to be better prepared. Look at the very beginning of the chapter in verse number one. The Bible says, these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Why? Because when when bad things happen, when trials come, when persecutions come, if you're not expecting it, if it just comes on you completely at unawares, it's a lot more likely to knock you down, get you out of the fight, totally just just blindside you, and and it's going to do a lot more damage to you than if you already know something's coming. You already have been prepared. Hey, there's a disaster coming. You need to be prepared. There's, there's this persecution coming. There's, there's going to be problems. There's going to be famine. There's going to be whatever the problem is. When you know about it, you can start getting ready for it. Yeah, you still have to go through the hard time, but knowing about it puts you at a huge advantage and it's going to help you be settled in your spirit and be able to stay strong in your faith because it's not just taking you by surprise. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Verse number two, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. This is talking about very severe persecution. He's saying, you know what? They're going to kick you out of church. They're going to put you out of the synagogue. But that's light compared to what he follows that up with. Right? These days, people would probably think it's a... And again, I'm not trying to belittle this, but... Someone gets kicked out of church or you know, something like that were to happen. Oh man, I'm just believing the Bible here and I'm just getting cast out. That's kind of a big deal, right? And, and you could think, and that, would, that could be probably for most of us today, that's one of the biggest things going on in your life. Man, I can't believe I got, you know, I got thrown out. I'm just trying to live my life according to, to what the scripture says. But then he says, Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. So it's not, they're not just going to be kicking you out of their, their congregation, but they're literally going to be putting you to death. Right. And this is a warning that Jesus Christ is giving. Now, this happened to the disciples, to very many of them. They were martyred. They were killed for the word of God just as Jesus was. They actually faced death. And many of the people that were doing the killing thought they were doing God's service. And so it's going to be in the end times as well. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, when he's performing these miracles, and the people that that worship the beast and take the mark of his name are convinced that, hey, this is the second coming of Christ, or this is God in the flesh. This is God. Look at all these great miracles that he's doing. And then he says, you know what? It's time to exterminate these Christians, these fundamental Baptists. They need to go. It's time to get them out of here. They're heretics. They think I'm the devil and I'm God, you know, and that's going to be what he's portraying. And then the people who are going to go and, and, and bring the persecution and put people like us to death are going to think they're doing God's service. Amen. They're going to think they're in the right. That's going to be their mindset. That's going to be their attitude. Jesus is giving this warning so that you're not surprised by that. To know that the day is coming. It is going to come. It's going to happen. This is scripture. This is prophecy. This is God's word. God's word never returns void. If God says something, you better believe it's going to happen. 
Bible says verse number 3, And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. Knowing is, is, is going to help you so much going into these problems, being prepared for them. We need to be prepared today because there's a spiritual battle that's raging. There is a spiritual warfare going on. I've mentioned this now in, in, in recent sermons. I don't know why it just seems to be coming up more frequently. Maybe it's just the different things that I've been dealing with in my personal life or whatever. It just seems to be a lot of battles and a lot of struggles and a lot of persecutions and a lot of people trying to stop what we're doing here from many different angles. There is a spiritual battle going on. And as we see the day approaching, the times are going to become more perilous. We are warned about this in Scripture. We're warned about this multiple times, multiple places, warning us that things will get worse. We need to be prepared for that. You need to be ready for that. The stage is already being set for the New World Order, the One World Government, to set up their system of of government and to usher in the Antichrist and the one world religion and and one currency. This is all prophesied in Scripture. We need to be aware of it and ready for it and understand what we're going to do. Now, there are many attacks in many areas where, where this agenda, the Antichrist agenda, is in play. And we're going to do our best to try to cover them, but we're not going to cover them all today. We're going to focus on one aspect today because... This is very multifaceted, and this is the way that Satan operates. I mean, he's a very um, intelligent creature, a very wise creature. And what we went over about a week or two in the book of Job, all of the attacks that he was able to bring on Job and the way that he was able to orchestrate all of those various attacks that happen and coincide with each other, also that the person relaying the message is showing up one after the other after the other. So we can see he's got a very good uh, level of detail and orchestration. Add to that, I mean, Satan's been around since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So there's lots and lots and lots of time to accumulate and amass more and more knowledge and more and more understanding of human beings and be able to put into play different plans that take a longer amount of time in order to um, to get done, in order to achieve. And this is why a lot of people fall short in a lot of the different truth movements when they're trying to understand who's behind the evil, who's behind the wicked plans, the you know, who are these people, these shadowy figures that are that are you know planning the new world order and some people will say well it's the catholic church some people will say it's the jews some people will say you know it's the Roth, rothschilds it's the you know these bankers it, you know whoever it is and the, the thing is they're all right to some degree because they're all being used and manipulated but at the end of the day the ultimate puppet master is satan himself that's right this is why, and this is why a lot of people have a hard time accepting some conspiracy theories because you say, well, wait a minute. How can things just continue to go from generation to generation? I mean, wouldn't somebody be like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to follow along with that when you have some of these wicked families. And, and what's their end game? I mean, if they're dying anyways and they're not really achieving the power that they're looking for and their eternal life on earth or whatever it is that, that their motivation may be, that they're doing these things, you can say the agenda agenda doesn't quite fit. Yep. Well, the reason why it doesn't fit is because you're not realizing Satan's behind all of it. Yep. Satan is the, is the power, the, the dark force behind all of it, using these men as pawns to bring about his system. It's all about him. He doesn't care about any one of these political leaders or powerful people that he's using and manipulating to bring in the system that he wants to have in place. Right. They don't, they don't matter to him one bit. It's all about him. That's why when he sets up his throne and, and he's going to sit in the temple showing himself that he is God, 
He's going to want all the glory and praise. It's all going to be about him. But in order for all of that to happen, he has to establish things in order to be the, the, the God of this world, as he already is, but to, to receive all the accolades and to be viewed as the Most High, which he is not, and to receive that level of adoration and worship. There's a lot of things that he needs to put into place in order for that to happen, in order for him to achieve his ultimate plan of being like the Most High. So the area that we're going to focus on today, and we're going to, I'm going to show you, you say, oh, Pastor Burzins, you're nuts. You've lost it. You're talking about conspiracy theories. You're talking about shadowy figures. What do you mean Satan's behind everything? Well, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 4. And I'm just going to prove this to you briefly here, that what is really behind these agendas that you see being pushed, that you know there's something being pushed here. And the one that we're going to be covering today is our speech. What we're allowed to say, the, you know, with the new enactment of, of hate speech, or you know, these concepts floating of hate speech. Trying to get hate speech made into a law, make it against the law to say things that are hateful. Or um, even just the amount of censorship that you see going on these days. The lack of a, of a flow of a freedom of information from people who are deemed to be uh, not, not promoting the established truth or whatever. Whoever, whoever the, the gatekeepers are that are in charge of allowing opinions or allowing information to flow... This is, this is becoming more and more evident. This is not just some conspiracy theory. This is happening, and it's very real. And the, the, the level to which it has escalated, it, it is not something that is subtle anymore. Right. Yeah. This has gone beyond even just religious speech. Now, I'm going to be applying this to religious speech specifically because that is the most important speech. But this has been applied now to political speech, to other just philosophies and ideologies all across the internet especially there's just censorship going on people are being shut down, people are being hurt financially based on what they think and say and believe. This is happening and we're going to deal with this subject this morning. But just to prove to you that there, this is a demonic or a satanic force behind these types of agendas. Behind the agenda to censor people's speech. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse number 5. This is when Jesus Christ was being tempted of the devil. Verse number 5, the, the Bible reads, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now, the Bible very clearly records Satan telling Jesus that he is given, it's been delivered unto him, the power of all the kingdoms of the earth. Now you could say, well, Satan's just lying there. That's right? something you could say. And the Bible does record verbatim what what people say it doesn't mean that it's necessarily true but i think that this is true because satan's also referred to us in the bible as the god of this world so it's it's no surprise that this has been delivered unto him and when you see the way the world operates and you see the the people that are in these high positions of power it seems very clear after a while that yes yeah, satan does seem to be running things down here now, we know ultimately God is the one who has total control in general. I mean, he's the one who has the power and the authority to allow things to happen or not. But God is not the one actively influencing behind all the, the global leaders and behind all the kingdoms of this world. And there's a false belief out there where a lot of Christians say, well, this is just God's will. It's God's will that we have President Trump. And before that, it was God's will we had President Obama. And before that, it was God's will we had President George Bush. And before that, it was God's will we had President... You know, no. Right, right. No, I don't believe that. I think it's Satan's will that we're getting a lot of these presents. Now, there may be a leader at some point that, that, that God 
elevates and that God lifts up and that God wants a certain person to be power. I have no, you know, obviously the scripture talks a lot about that as well. But just to say every single leader that exists that's been in, that's, that's been in power always is what God wants to have in power, I don't believe that. I don't think it lines up exactly with his will. God's able to use people for his own agenda, but it's not, um, it's not necessarily his will that these, these evil, wicked people are in charge of, of, the, of, the, of the various kingdoms of the world. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 is a famous passage that talks about the armor of God. And that us as Christians, we need to be prepared. We need to be well defended and well prepared to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because we're involved in a spiritual battle, as I was just mentioning, we need to have an armor that we're wearing. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, verse number 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Very clear. The Bible is teaching us there is spiritual wickedness in high places. What's a high place? A place of a lot of power, authority. Those are the high places. And there is rulers of darkness. They are, there's spiritual wickedness in these high places. And that, that is our fight. That is our battle. That's the spiritual battle that's going on. It's not a physical one. We're not trying to you know, overthrow governments by taking up arms and going in and performing a coup. No, they're bringing forth their ideas. They're trying to institute bondage. They're trying to bring people into slavery. They're trying to bring about Satan's system. They're being used and manipulated by the ultimate planner, the devil. And we are supposed to fight against that evil. We are supposed to fight against that wickedness. And I believe, well, how do you do it? It's not a physical one. So how are we going to do this? We're going to have to do this with our words. We're going to have to do this with our actions, yes, but with our words, most importantly, with being able to stand up for the truth. Turn, if you would, to Daniel chapter number 10. I just want to show you one more place where we literally see it's not even just as vague, if you want to call this verse vague, vague in Ephesians 6, of there being spiritual wickedness in high places. Much more specifically, we see a real example of the spiritual fight that's going on and the influence over kings and rulers in human government. There's multiple places in Scripture that talk about this. We're going to look at one in Daniel chapter 10. And in Daniel chapter 10, this is a passage where Daniel was praying unto God for some understanding and God sending an angel. But what happens is that angel is deterred from actually going to Daniel. As soon as Daniel started praying, God said, okay, I want you to go down and minister unto Daniel and tell him, you know, what you're what supposed to tell him and everything else. But on the way, there's a problem with one of the kings and one of the kingdoms. And look what it says in Daniel 10, verse number 12. The Bible says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and did chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Persia, that's, a, that's a worldly country, a worldly kingdom, the kingdom of Persia. This isn't some heavenly kingdom. This is the kingdom of Persia. He said, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. So for 21 days, this angel is being held up by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. I don't believe he's being held up by a man, by a, by a human being holding up an angel. He's being held up by a devil. Amen who is behind the power, the real prince of the kingdom of Persia, the one who is really running things, not the human figurehead, but the dark force behind that person that is leading them into whatever decision-making they're doing and in and, and their ruling of the kingdom. He says, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Of course, Michael is an angel. He's an archangel came to help this other angel. One of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So he stayed there because why? Because there was a spiritual battle going on. 
in a place of power, in a place where, where there's kings ruling. This battle continues. You can't see it, but it's happening. And I just spent a lot of time in the past few weeks. We went over angels and devils in the Bible. They're real. Just because you can't see it, you can't see Jesus Christ, He's real. You can't see God, He's real. Everything that this book tells us about is the truth. So the way that we fight against this is using words, using speech. Words are powerful. And the title of my sermon this morning is The Power of Speech and the Fight Against Censorship. Because our speech is, I mean, th- that is the most effective weapon that we have is being able to use our words. By far. That is going to see the most done in general. The, the Just word, using words. I mean, think about, aside from humanly speaking, think about God. How did God create the world? He spake him into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, those are God's words. But those words are powerful. How about Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. Look at the theme. Look throughout the Scripture. How much is is words being referenced and used and talked about? What is it that we're being told to do? Preach. Speak. What, what commandment is given over and over again? What is God trying to tell His prophets to do? What are, we, what are the prophets for? We have all these prophets. We have Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all the minor prophets. All the prophets, what are they doing? They're prophesying. How do they prophesy? They use their words. They're speaking. They're preaching. They're, they're preaching the Word of God. If we lose our ability... To speak. We lose almost everything. This is something that needs to be fought for. This is something that that cannot be just brushed aside and let go and and let the enemy continue with their their plan to just silence those that are going to promote God and promote God's word and promote the truth. Amen. The Bible warns us in James chapter 3 about our tongues because our tongues are so powerful. Because there is so much that can be done. So when you look at it from a, you know, a potentially negative aspect, right? We, we've got the ability to do great things. We've got the ability to also cause a lot of great damage with our tongues because our words are so powerful. I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of how powerful your words can be. James 3, verse number 1, the Bible reads, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. When you speak, you're going to be offending somebody. If any man's able to offend not in your words... Bible says you're perfect. (laughs) Then you're able to control your entire body. I mean, you've got everything just nailed down. If you're able to speak and never offend anybody, nobody can do that. Verse number three, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So now it's relating our tongue as being just a real small part of our body in size, and relating that to a fire. And think of how a fire can start off very small. Someone can throw a cigarette out their window, and this is very common in California and in Arizona. We have wildfires. Someone just throws cigarette butt. It's not even on fire. There's just enough burning there, though, to ignite a small fire. And before you know it, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And you've got acres upon acres, thousands of acres just being burned up and destroyed and destroying property and destroying life. 
all from one, one little spark, one little fire that started the whole thing. That level of destruction, that level of, of, of um, how quickly the, the fire could spread is being applied to your tongue. You can say one word, just one sentence, one thought, come out of your mouth and start a firestorm of controversy and people who are offended. We've seen, we got a little dose of that recently. And we're still reaping from that. The Bible says in verse number 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is, unset, it is set on fire of hell. Obviously, we need to be careful with our words. Because of the power, because of how much gravity our words have, and the amount of effect and influence our words can have. We need to choose our words carefully. We don't want to be in sin. We don't want to be using our words in a way that's going to defile our body. We want to use it for good. The Bible says in um, Hebrews 4.12, of course, the most powerful words that we can use and we should be using and what we need to fight for is the Word of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God. I'm going to read that slower. It's quick. It means it brings life. It's alive. The Word of God is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. A two-edged sword, talking about a real literal sword, the Word of God is even sharper than that. That's right. No matter how sharp you make that edge, you can split a hair in two. The Word of God is sharper than that. Piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It's able to split. The word of God is able to split a person's soul from their spirit. That's what it's saying. That's how, that's how sharp it is. That's how powerful God's word is. And of the joints and marrow, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It cuts right into your heart. Right into your mind. God's word penetrates all the way through. Power of God's word is essential for people getting saved. Of course, for our salvation, for receiving eternal life. Hearing and believing these words has enough power to save a soul from hell. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is our weapon. We were were in Ephesians 6 earlier. This is the weapon that we need to be equipped with. When, we, when you go through the list of the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 6, 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So you could read through Ephesians 6 later. You could get all the pieces, your, your helmet and your shield and the breastplate. And you could get all the different uh, pieces that you need as defensive uh, pieces against attacks and to be able to withstand and to be able to Um, just stand forward and get through the attacks but then the one thing that it mentions that would be a weapon is the sword which is the word of God I don't know about you but I don't want to be left standing with no weapon in my hand if we're engaged in a spiritual battle if we're going to be in a spiritual fight yeah I want to have all the armor I want to be protected absolutely absolutely But the best way and the first line of defense is going to be that sword to to use as a defensive weapon, but then also be able to use it as an offensive weapon. And that's the Word of God. And we need to be fighting for the ability to preach the Word of God unadulterated. We need to be fighting against the people who want to silence God's Word, who want to just shut us up, and intimidate you and put you in fear and scare you into thinking that I can't say certain things that are written in the Bible. And the attacks are going to come. And this is something that I'm passionate about. Why? Because I've been experiencing the effects of this very recently when it comes to my own livelihood. Now when it comes to who would have thought in God's country, right? The United States of America, we're a Christian nation. That a man that preaches God's word in its entirety, is now all of a sudden facing losing jobs. 
Yeah. Lost one job, almost lost the second job. All as a result of what? The words that I speak. That's right. yeah. It's my words. Yeah. Is it because I'm some bad employee? Nope. Right. Right. Is it because I'm treating people poorly? Nope. No, it's because of my words. And it's, you know what? It's not because of my words. It's not. It's because I'm repeating words that are found in this book. Right. And I'm just saying it real loud. I'm just, I'm just turning up the volume on what's already written here. It's all I'm doing. I can't take credit for what this book says. Absolutely not. I will not. But this is what we're, we're coming to in this country. And the goal is to get people like me to shut up. To scare people into thinking, we'll take your job. We'll take your money away. You know what? I'm not backing down. I'm not going to back down. You know what? You know what's only going to do? It's going to make me push even harder. Yep. You want to try to take away my speech? You want to tell me I can't preach God's word? Well, guess what? Right. I'm going to preach it even louder. Right. And I'm going to try to find a bigger venue. And I'm going to try to reach more people. And you want to shut down my YouTube channel. I'm going to find another mechanism. I'm going to find some way. You know what? You can't take my vocal cords away unless you cut my head off. Amen. Amen. And you know what? That might happen someday. Yeah. And the Bible warns us about that too. Yeah. But even that will not stop me. You know what? That's what they're going to have to do. Amen. And we need more people with this type of an attitude to push back, to say, no, we are going to proclaim the word of God. We're not going to allow you to censor us. You're not going to silence us. You're not going to silence the word of God. It's going to be preached whether you like it or not, Snowflake. That's right. Amen. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter number 5. Our words are so powerful. God's word is so much more. It really makes a lot of sense that the attack on speech is here. It's been around for a while, but it's just gaining more of a foothold now. Because like I said, we're supposed to be a country founded on biblical principles. We're supposed to be this Christian nation. That's why it's been so hard to censor the speech. That's why Satan has used other mechanisms through his false prophets to try to deceive people and get people off on, on different paths. But once he has a, a, a control grid in place, like in communist China, like in other areas, other kingdoms of the world, then he can just clamp down and use that fear and just try to squash out and silence it. He'll start off trying to get people just steered off one direction or another until he gets to the point where he says it's just not allowed at all. Yeah. And that's the ultimate goal. And that's the direction we are headed. Right. Amen. <clears throat> Our words are the best weapon. Words motivate people to action. And the enemy is scared of that. Words encourage people to resist the evil. I mean, he doesn't like to hear that. He wants you scared. Words enlighten people with truth. Bring knowledge. It's no surprise Satan wants to stop the word of God. The only surprise comes from how much hatred there is for the word of God in a supposedly Christian nation. Christians themselves have been brainwashed into thinking that Christians are only supposed to speak things that are comfortable. And nice, and pleasant, and cordial. Never say anything that offends. If that's the case, Jesus wasn't very Christ-like in these people's minds. Why? Because they haven't read their Bible. They've gotten lazy. They're asleep. And that's why when persecution comes, it's going to come on them as a thief in the night. They're not paying any attention. They're not reading the word. They're not, they're not keeping up themselves with God's word and reading how Jesus rebuked the wicked, how Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, how Jesus didn't hold back in his preaching. 
People are buying into this notion of hate speech as if, as if it's even a thing. I mean, you, could, you can say, okay, if that's hateful, that's hate speech, or that's love speech, whatever. But the, the reason why this is becoming dangerous is that this is a concept that's been promoted in order to associate speaking something that's hateful as being against the law. People, there's many people today who think that some of the things that I preach is against the law. Because they're just completely ignorant because they've been brainwashed because, see, that's where the manipulation comes in. That's where the mass media comes in. That's where Satan's plan comes in to try to convince people that it's against the law. You can't even say those things. Yeah. Without that even being true, and then it makes it a lot easier to enact a law like that because people, oh, I, I didn't even know that wasn't the law. Yeah, that should be a law. Yeah. Because you've heard about it so much because you're, you're being brainwashed watching this, this garbage and nonsense yeah. on your television instead of getting your eyes focused on God's Word. This concept of, of hate speech, especially in, re, in relation to religion, to the Bible, to God's word, is so contrary even to the founding document of our country and the Constitution of the United States. It really, I mean, that's why we're known as a Christian nation. It's one of the reasons why is because of all the, what, what this country was founded on and all the, the religious persecution that people had to endure in England and in other places before coming to this country because they didn't want to have to deal with the oppression, deal with the persecution, that it was so important that when they made this constitution, this agreement of these states joining together and becoming this government, that they, they wanted to make sure amendment number one, point number one, bill of right number one, we just need to state this because if it's not stated, the government's going to already try to usurp authority. There's going to be wicked people that are going to try to take these rights away from you. This was the concern when the Constitution was created. That, and this is the reason why we have a Bill of Rights. And, there's, and this is the reason why this stuff isn't even being taught today. Kids are being dumbed down. They're not being taught even anything about this. Why? It's going to be that much easier, again, to enact laws that just completely go against even what amendment number one of the U.S. Constitution says. And I'll read it for you in case you don't know it. The, the, the Bible. It's not the Bible. Far from the Bible. But the first amendment to the Constitution reads Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So without even reading the rest of that supposedly according to the U.S. Constitution there can be no law that can be enacted that's going to restrict the free exercise of our religion. And how do you exercise your religion? You preach the Word of God. And people are so ignorant to this, they actually think that saying homos ought to be put to death because that's what the Bible says because Leviticus 20.13 says that if a man lie with mankind lie with a woman he shall surely be put to death his blood shall be upon him it, by reading it oh how hateful well it's not loving right? but you know what is loving the people who are, who are violated by these perverts yeah, that's right but yeah, generally, killing someone is not going to be looked on as, as loving. So what? Right. We've got freedom. Or at least we had. We're losing it. We need a lot more people to stand up. And look, I'm not some, you know, super patriot. I'm not rah, rah, United States. That's not what I'm talking about here. I thank God for the blessing that I happen to be born in a place that has something like this written down that's supposed to be the law of the land. Right. That is a blessing. Because yeah, there's so many places and so many other you know, time periods that haven't had that. Right. That's right. It is valuable. And it is much appreciated. 
we need to do our diligence to try to keep that aspect, keep that as, as something that we could continue to promote for generations to come. We know we're going to be persecuted for it. We know that ultimately times are going to get so bad that people will be killed for preaching the word of God. We know it's going to happen, but it doesn't mean you don't fight. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Because we also know, be of good cheer, as Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Yeah. Christians need to wake up to what is happening. Because this is going to directly impact anyone that actually wants to preach all the counsel of God. Right. We need to, to defend our right. <clears throat> We need to defend our right to speak. Not because it's written in some constitution, but because God commands us to preach his word. You're in Acts chapter 5. This is how the disciples dealt with persecution. Because it came their way. Based off what they were preaching, what they were saying. Acts 5 verse number 17. The Bible reads, Then, came, excuse me, then the high priest rose up, And all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So what's happening here? The apostles, they're put in prison by the authorities. Because they don't like what they're doing. They don't like what they're saying. But what does God say? Does God say, well, listen to the authorities. I mean, you're causing trouble already, you troublemakers. Don't you know? Can you just keep your mouth shut for a while and just do it secretly? I mean, can't you just take people aside and just talk to them so you don't get in trouble? I mean, that would be the that would be the right thing to do because, you know, you got to you got to respect the authority. Oh, wait, no, that's not what happens here. No, God sends an angel to just get him out of prison. How dare you, God? Aren't you going to respect? I mean, they haven't been set free on on bail yet. No, God sends an angel to free him from prison and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to people all the words of this life. God wants them to preach. Speak all the words of this life. Tell them everything. Don't hold anything back. All the words of this life. That's what they're commanded to do. Verse number 21, And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. Said, all right, we're going to do it. We need to have this type of attitude. If you're ever thrown into prison based on, because you're preaching God's word, because you're preaching the truth, when you get let out, don't be afraid Of going back in. Don't let them scare you. Because that's what they want to do. If they scare you, then they win. That's right. So they went into the temple early in the morning and taught, verse 21. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. So now all the really important people get together, like, okay, bring forth those, those uh, troublemakers. Bring forth those people. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. So now they're really confused. What's going on now? Why are they not in the prison? Verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Amen. 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 Verse 26. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. One more important key to look at here of how powerful words can be. Notice in front of all the people that they're preaching to, they can't take them, they can't go, 
what are you guys doing? Video and, and just tackle them and beat them up and bring them back after they escaped from prison. They feared the people. And see, that's how you keep a wicked, wicked rulers in check. Right. Is with enough people that are righteous. Yeah. And enough people that aren't going to allow unrighteous things like that to happen. And they're going to stand up and say, no, you're not going to do this. They were actually, they were afraid for their lives. And that's the only way a government can function is when the government is scared of the people instead of the people being scared of the government. Right, that's right. Now, they still do persecute and abuse these people, but what my point is that they couldn't do it openly. They couldn't do it in front of everyone else. They had to, they had to hide and do it in secret. Why? Because the apostles were having an impact with their words on the people that were listening to them. Which is exactly why God told them to go and preach. Because they're having an influence on the people that are hearing the word of God. Right. That's why God wants us to preach. So we can have an influence on people with the word of God. Yeah. Verse number 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. Did they say, oh, I'm sorry, we won't do that again? <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, you can tell us not to preach. Right. You can tell us not to preach the word of God, but you know what? We're going to obey God. That's right. Amen. And that is our ultimate authority. That's right. Now, we're taught in other places of Scripture, you know, basically, as much as lieth in us, live peaceably with other people, to get along, to follow the, the, the laws of the land, and to get along with the governments, and get along with everybody, and do what we can. But at the end of the day, we cannot violate God's law. That's right. Cannot do it. Amen. And I cannot violate my position of being a preacher to come up here and censor God's word because I'm worried about financial repercussions. Right. Because I'm worried about physical repercussions. Because I'm worried about anything else. Hey, I need to fear God. That's right. right. Amen. And I'm going to obey God rather than men. Amen. Whether it's my boss, whether it's your boss, whether it's the cops, whether it's the governor, whether it's whoever. Yeah, that's right. Amen. So they berate him and yell him a little bit. Jump down to verse number 40. We'll jump down in the story here in Acts chapter 5. We're almost done. Verse number 40, the Bible reads, and to him they agreed. So this one guy kind of stands up for him when trying to figure out what to do. And he's like, well, wait, let's just give him a little bit of space. Right? Let's, if it's not of God, nothing's going to happen. Right? They'll just end up going away and it won't be a big deal. Verse 40, it says, and to him they agreed. But when they had called the apostles and beaten them, so they still get beat for preaching the word of God. Now God delivered them from prison and told them to preach. They still got beat. There are persecutions that are going to come. Right. Be prepared for it. We may not be there right now, but the time's going to come. It will come because Scripture says so. I don't know exactly how fast it will come, but you just need to be ready to be able to take a beating for the Word of God Man. if necessary. Yeah. Be thrown in jail for the Word of God and not back down. They took a beating, but did that let them get down? Look, at it says, it says here, and beating them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they, don't be preaching about Jesus anymore. And they throw them out. How did the apostles respond? Look at verse number 41. And they departed from the presence of the council Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Amen. 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 Rejoicing means they had joy. Right. They just got beat. Amen. They just got, got berated. They just got told, hey, you can't do this. Right. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Woohoo. <laughs> what a day. Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Amen. 
Why? Because when you get beat, when you get mocked, when you get persecuted, you're in good company because what did they do to Jesus Christ Himself? And if you're going to be allowed to be put in that type of a position to be able to experience what Jesus was going through, hey, rejoice for that. You're worthy to suffer shame for His name. Again, not for your own misgivings, not for your own misdeeds, not for your own crimes, for His name. Verse number 42. And what, what happened? Did they, did they get scared and, and stop preaching about Jesus? No. And I, and I love this verse, but I, I always, when I, when I reference this verse, I try to provide the context because the context makes it so much more powerful. When you understand that they were arrested, when you understand that they were beaten, and then you read verse number 42, and daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Yeah. In the face of opposition, in the face of beating, in the face of persecution, in the midst of it, they cease not. Amen. We're not going to stop. Amen. God needs more people that are going to say, I'm not going to stop. That's right. You want to silence me, I'm going to late raise my voice. And I've got a pretty loud voice. There's a war on speech today, so what do we do about it? Am I going to go and sue my employers for infringing on my rights to speak my mind? I could, but I didn't. If you decide to do something like that, I wouldn't be against you. I don't th- you know, it's your, your prerogative. Do what you want. I just don't see this as being that type of a battle. It's not going to change them making them pay a little bit of extra money. And what's it going to do for me? Give me a little bit of extra money? I know that God's going to take care of me. I don't need to get distracted and get into the courts and, and, and do all that over, over some of these things. I'm not, I'm not worried about, and I don't think the apostles were, were, were concerned, even if they could, and I don't know what the laws were at the time. They could say, well, we were wrongfully, you know, we were beaten, we, weren't, we were mistreated, we were wrongfully in prison. You don't see anybody just, just going to law. Now, you see the apostle Paul using law when, when he could to be able to speak and to be able to defend himself and to not get thrown into prison when possible. Yeah, amen, I'm going to do the same thing. But you don't see them taking this legal battle approach of saying, well, now we're going to get back at you by, by going through our wicked, corrupt court system and, and try to exact justice that way. I don't, I don't see that. So that's not what I focus on. I know that the Bible says that we need to overcome evil with good, though. And... Since I've got faith that as long as I can stay true and I can preach God's word, I know God's going to take care of me. I don't need their money. Right. And I know that God's already promised that if we suffer shame for his name, that he's going to reward us. And I'd much rather have the reward of God than any financial amount of settlement that I could get on this earth. Right. Right. I'll just put away that savings in my heavenly savings account right. for, for, for eternity. Instead of an extra few thousand dollars for a couple months or whatever on this earth. I'm not worried about that. I don't want to get involved in that fight. That's that, that particular just, just getting involved in the court thing. No. But I'm not going to let them shut me up. I don't care if there was not a person in the state of Georgia that's going to employ me because of my beliefs. I won't shut up. And you know what? God will take care of me. No doubt in my mind. So you want to hold a carrot in front of my nose and say, well, be a good little boy, be a good puppy, and and we'll let you keep your job. Not if it means shutting my mouth. Not if it means I have to not expose wickedness. What's interesting is how all of this started. All started with a little video up on YouTube about the Atlanta Pride Parade. Sodomite. 
reprobates, the filth of the world. That's what offends people these days. The most vile, disgusting people that you just call out for being vile and disgusting, that's where it all boiled down to. Where are we as a nation? Not in good standing. And that's the type of speech that's trying to be censored. That's at the forefront of trying to be censored. Why? Because that's part of the spiritual wickedness that has gotten into high places that doesn't want to be exposed. So they're going to attack the hardest on people that are shining the light on that wickedness. Must have hit a nerve. Mm -hmm. Now I know what button to keep pressing. (laughs) Because more people need to hear about this. God's word needs to be preached that much more. It's not your duty as a patriot to practice your free speech. It's your duty as a Christian to preach the word of God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great book of wisdom and the the knowledge that you've imparted unto us, Lord. I pray that you would please help us to be bold and to be strong in your words and to never back down, Lord, but to um, be able to preach your word, to be instant in season and out of season, Lord, to be able to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. God, help us to do the things that you've instructed us to do. Lord, help us not to be fearful. I pray that you will please help everybody in our church to be able to edify and comfort one another as trials and tribulations and persecutions arise. Lord, help us to be able to encourage each other to keep going, to fight the good fight, Lord. And um, God, we want to be used of you greatly. Help us to reach many people, not only with the gospel of Christ, but with everything that you've taught. Lord, that we can just be a mouthpiece for the word of God in the state of Georgia. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.